Everybody, how's how's it going this morning? G- good. That, that was such a gentle introduction. I feel like I couldn't come in and be like, "Hey, you know." It's so peaceful. My name's Charlie. If we haven't met, I'm the senior pastor. I'd love to meet you. If you're walk- watching online, welcome. Today, I'm excited. We pick back up in Matthew. If you're new to CBC, we've done this thing for the last. This is the fourth year. Every spring, after we do a spiritual practice or discipline, we dive into Matthew a chapter or two at a time. We started in Matthew 5, and now we're all the way to Matthew 10, four short years later, everybody. It's going to be good. So for the next eight weeks, we're going to be in chapter 10 and 11, leading up into Easter. And I can't wait to dive into it. It's, it's a really fascinating text. It's kind of the first time the disciples find that following Jesus isn't easy in a way they never had before. So it's going to be a, a fun-filled couple months, but before we do that, if you're new, you haven't been around, if you've been around, when we gather on Sunday mornings, we, we recognize intentionally that this space is different than the world we live and operate in, that we are being formed by what happens in this room, and as we connect with Jesus and the Holy Spirit invites us into the worship of a God who's worthy, instead of being shaped and formed by a critical culture that often is centered around me, And so we take a moment just to recognize the difference in the two, and we want to intentionally this morning be worshipers of God, and we want to intentionally this morning ask the Holy Spirit where he's working. And so we show up today to be contributors to the conversation of faith, not critics. And what that means today is we sit down and we open the scripture, and we don't judge a sermon, or we don't judge worship about if it's in the key I like, or in tune or not in tune, or as fast or slow as I want. We simply want to ask this morning, God, where are you speaking to me as you are speaking to me? So we're going to take a second, we're just going to pray that God might speak to us, that we might hear it, and I'm going to ask that you pray for me um, as we teach the word this morning, so join me. God, I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful each and every week to find a place where I'm reminded what really matters, where I'm reminded who you are and how you are the one that gets to form me, not the world around me. Holy Spirit, as we open your scripture this morning, speak to us. You are here, might we hear your voice? If you're comfortable, I would just ask that you take a, a few seconds and say a prayer and just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your spirit this morning as we open the scriptures. That's the pray for me, that I might do a good job showing us the goodness of God this morning as we talk about how we talk about Jesus with our friends this morning, that people might not just see a dude and hear a message, but have an encounter with the Holy Spirit through the scriptures. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said... If you've got a Bible, we're going to be in Matthew 10, 1 to 15 this morning. This text is a little interesting, and we'll get there in, in just a second. But first, it's confession time from Chuck, all right? Um, when, I, when I first started to become a pastor, this is 14 years ago, for a long time, I don't know, there's 5, 6, 10, 13 and a half years, when people asked me what I did, I didn't necessarily lead with, I'm a pastor, I didn't lie. I said, I work for a nonprofit. I said, I'm in the business of doing good. I said a lot of things, but sometimes pastor. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And I I excused it by saying, well, man, it just gets awkward really quickly. Because the second I say I'm a pastor, you hear all your baggage. And then you tell me about it, right? So I'd be playing golf and they'd say, what do you do? Or like I'd play with my dad and he's really proud. He'd be like, you know, we're at the first tee box. My son's a pastor. I'd be like, thanks, dad. And and the person we're playing with would be like, man, I... I went to church a couple months ago, and I'd say, well, good for you. (laughs) You want to, right? It just made things awkward, you know? (laughs) 
<laughs> or I'd say, hey, I'm a pastor. They'd be like, I don't like pastors. Well, this is going well, you know? And if I'm honest, there was part of me that didn't tell people I was a pastor because I want to bring it up in different ways. But if I'm also honest, there's part of me that didn't because it got awkward and I didn't know what to do with it. I say that because I get paid to be a pastor and it's my privilege and it's an honor and it's a calling. But sometimes talking about Jesus to people that don't know Jesus is difficult. It's just hard. It makes things awkward (laughs) whether we know people or don't know people. But here's the truth that we see in scripture that Nick talked about last week is that God uses us not just to watch Jesus work, but to work with Jesus. God uses us not to watch him repair the world, but as people that help him repair the world. The gospel is active and it calls us to participate. And sometimes that means, a lot of times that means talking to people about Jesus. But now more than ever, it's really, really, really difficult to tell people about our faith. I can throw numbers and studies out at you if I want to. Barna did one. I've quoted it before. I keep coming back to it. It it talks about especially millennials and how they share their faith. And it says that almost all, this is a study from 2020, almost all practicing Christians believe that part of their faith means being a witness about Jesus. 95 to 97% believe that. Millennials would also say that the best thing that could happen to somebody is to know Jesus. About 97% say that. But then it goes on and says 40% of millennials agree, at least somewhat, that it's wrong to share your personal beliefs with someone of different faith in hopes that they too will share your faith. In a study they put out a little while later in called the Spiritual Connections in a Digital Age Workshop, it said three out of five Christian millennials believe that people today are more likely than in the past to take offense if they share their faith. That's about 65%. Said three times as many millennials as other groups feel that if you disagree with somebody, it's judgment. We live in a place where it's hard to share your faith. It's awkward to share your faith. It's difficult to share faith. But but we operate in a world and in a faith where it's essential to share our faith. And And so today, the moment that we're in as we pick up in Matthew 10 is the first time Jesus said, this isn't just my job, it's yours too. And he sends them out. It's the first time he says to his followers, you've seen me work, now guess what? You guys get to walk this out in your life. It's the first time that he calls them to be doers of his kingdom, not just hearers of his kingdom. And it brings up this question inside of me, how are we at sharing our faith with those around us? And so what we're going to do today as we dive into the first 15 verses, it's an extremely practical set of scriptures. Meaning what Jesus does is he looks at these men where they're at and he says, let me give you some tips as you go. And so today is very, very practical on on some kind of principles we find as we share scriptures. And just full disclosure, this is not in my wheelhouse of how I like to teach scriptures. I called Delin on Friday and I said, Delin, I got a problem. And she said, what? And I said, this sermon is shaping up to be very, very practical. I said, right now I have like seven principles of sharing your faith with other people. And she said on the phone, Charlie, practicalness is not a problem. (laughs) And I said, that's not, I'm more of an ethereal person. I spent Friday night hanging out with some friends. And the highlight of that night to me was a heated discussion on the authorship of the first five books of the Bible, right? Is it Moses? Was it JDEP? I love it. Can we figure it out? Probably not, but let's keep talking about it, you know? And, And so today what we do is we come to some scriptures And we see what Jesus says to his people. Hey, this is what it looks like to spread the kingdom of Jesus. This is what it looks like to talk to your friends and neighbors. It's hard, but it's good. And and so today, as we walk through this, we have seven principles of what it's like for them. And I think translates to us of what it looks like to live out, walk out, share our belief in Jesus with those around us. So let's start. Matthew 10, 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits so they could cast them out and heal every kind of sickness and diseases. We talked about this cultural moment for a second. This verse is really big. It's a a major shift in the narrative style in Matthew between the first nine chapters and this one. What you see here is pretty remarkable. And, And if you've been tracking with us through Matthew, let me just outline where we're at in the book. So Jesus comes on the scene in Matthew 4. He starts doing miracles and healing people, and then he sits down in Matthew 5, 1, and he says, guys, this is all pretty new to you, but let me tell you what this looks like. Let me tell you what my kingdom's like. And he spends Matthew 5, 6, and 7, also known as the Sermon on the Mount, 
outlining the family values of his family, outlining this is what my kingdom is all about. You've twisted what God's heart is. Let me show you what God's heart is. And he sits down with them in his biggest sermon, and he said, this is what my kingdom is about. These are our principles and our values. And then chapter 8 begins with him saying he, he got up down off the mountain. He's likening him to Moses as he's delivering his people. And then he starts walking it out. So he gives this beautiful picture of the healing and freedom his kingdom sends people. And, and then after that, he says, now actually let me show you that my action can back up my speech. And he starts talking through what it looks like and living out what it looks like to actually be a part of this kingdom. And chapters 8 and 9, he starts healing people and forgiving people and bringing wholeness to people so that the words he said weren't empty but actually full of not just promise but hope because the promise is actualized in Jesus. And that's all well and good. And then you get to chapter 10. And it says, he called his 12 disciples and gave them authority. This is the first time where we see in the scriptures, Jesus calls his disciples disciples. This is the first time that he sends them out. And by the way, you can go back and look in in chapter 4, verse 23, and chapter 9, verse 35. The same phrase that's used to describe Jesus doing his ministry, Jesus is using to describe his disciples as they go. He's not holding anything back. He's passing it out. And so he continues on. And you can read the list if you want to, but then he reads the names of the 12 disciples there. And this gets us to our very first principle of sharing Jesus with those around us, that God simply uses you. And I know you might think, no kidding, but that's a really hard one to actually believe. There are things that we want to believe and things that we actually believe is true. I remember (coughs) when I got dropped off for college. I was... 18 years old, I went to school in Chicago, I grew up here, and I didn't know what I didn't know at that point. I didn't know that the northern culture was quite a bit different than the southern culture. I didn't know, not having grown up in a very, you know, strong church attendance family, I didn't do the youth group thing, I didn't know what a really nuanced and strong Christian culture was like that I found myself in. I showed up on campus, and I by far had the longest hair of any dude on campus in Chicago, and everybody kept staring at me. I lost my keys that first day. I didn't love my roommate that first day. I didn't have many friends. I didn't know anybody. And I remember the moment that my parents said, we're going to go now. And I remember my mom saying, you looked terrified. (laughs) And I remember my dad looking at me, sticking out his hand and saying, well, we'll see you at Christmas and walking away. (laughs) My family's loving. (laughs) I remember that. I thought to myself, I'm not ready to do this yet. But they knew I was. See, the problem sometimes when we read lists of the disciples' names is that we feel like when the first one is Peter in most of the lists of disciples, that the Peter that we read in Acts 2 is the Peter that we find in Matthew 10, and they're very different people. What we do is we see the superstar Peter, and we assume that's who he is right here, right now, not a scared, year-long disciple of Jesus saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but God, you're sending me anyway. And what that does for us is we think somehow that we are not on the same level as these guys that Jesus sent. I think the first thing we have to recognize when we look through this list of people is quite simply that God sends you, not a future version of yourself, (laughs) not a past version of yourself, not the you you're going to be when you finish that right now media class or spend more time in the scriptures or more time praying, all good things. But the you that Jesus sent with the disciples was the not fully formed disciples yet and the you that Jesus sends when he sends the church into the world to tell people about the goodness of God is not a perfect one. That's why we say often in the church world that God doesn't call the perfect, but he perfects the called. You might say, yeah, there are more important people that can share Jesus. No, there's not. You might say there's more equipped people that can share Jesus, not with the people God brings into your life. You might say, Charlie, I had doubts. Thomas is on that list. Charlie, I have a past. Matthew's on that list. Charlie, I had a bad day yesterday. Peter leads that list. I think the first thing we have to recognize when we talk about the ability of people to share Jesus with those around them is that it starts with us and God's big enough to overcome all of us, good and bad. That's why he calls them disciples. Not to get too far into it, but a disciple, especially in the first century world, was someone who tried to be just like their master in every single way. It's a journey, and it's not instantaneous. I, I, love, I love how Eugene Peterson describes disciple. He says a disciple is long obedience in the same direction. 
That's what God, that's the, those are the people that God calls to follow and to share the influence of Jesus in the world around them. <laughs> those people who have a long obedience in the same direction in good days and bad days. So often when we read the scriptures, we skip over lists, but this list shows me that God uses imperfect people to show his perfection to those around us. That's really important. It does two things for us real quick. One is it gives us confidence that God's bigger than our failures. And two is it gives us even more insight into the grace of God who uses us because it's his choice, not that he has to. God is good to us. So he allows us to be a part of his message of goodness. And so as he goes, he says, I'm going to send you guys, and he lists their names. Skip down to verses 5 and 6. He says, do not go on the road that leads to the Gentile regions, and do not enter any Samaritan town. Go instead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is first um, definition or description of what to do. He's giving practical advice in a first century world. We might read it and say, what does that mean? What does that matter? Essentially, what he's telling his people is start with what you know. Right? There's a, there's a map that we have. You probably can't read it, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway because I want you guys to think that I'm smart. So there's a map of first century Israel. And what you don't see, what you can't see, is that yellow part up top is Galilee. That's where they were. They were in Galilee. Then that purple part, I think it's purple, I'm colorblind, but it's some version of blue. In the middle there is Samaria. Those guys did not like the Israelites and vice versa. They're the byproduct of the Assyrian captivity. The Israelites felt like they were a half-breed version of the Jew. And then beneath that right there in the pink is the rest of Judea. That's where Jerusalem is and um, the temple and all those things. And literally what would happen when, when Jews would, would, would go from Galilee, which was part of Israel, down to Judah, which was the majority of Israel, there was one road they would take and try to avoid all of Samaria because they hated them so much. Jesus says to his people, hey, just stick in Galilee, would you? This is the first time he sent them out. And he's saying, maybe right now don't go to the hard places because you're new at this. I think it's a really good principle for us as we talk about how we spread the influence of Jesus is simply share or start with what you know because starting with what you know is easier than starting with what you don't. Just 101. So, so you might be saying, I don't know where to begin. You, 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 you begin in your neighborhood. You begin with your friends you already have. You begin with what God brings into your life. And there is no version or, or degree of better in sharing the influence of Jesus, whether it's here or whether it's in Haiti. Because sharing Jesus with anybody is what we're called to do. And sharing Jesus with those whom we already know is just easier. I can give you story on story and story of this funny and not funny. I'll start with funny and I'll only give you one. But I lived in Guatemala for a while. And I went there to teach about Jesus. I went there to bring Jesus to this little town and village. And look, I, I, I loved it. It was fantastic. I was the only white dude in this little town. I lived with this other, this principal of the school. And every night I would walk home in this little town and I'd walk by people. I didn't know much Spanish when I got down there. I knew the curse words because I grew up in Texas in high school and that's about it. And, but you couldn't really use those in evangelism. <laughs> um, and so I'd walk home every night and I had a small Texas accent that I've tried to drown out, but you know, you can't. And I would walk past people, and you'd say, like, Buenos Noches when you're going to bed to people. But a small Texas accent, so I'd say, yeah, Buenos Noches, right? <laughs> the principal pulled me aside and said, Charlie, we got to talk. I said, what? She said, if you're going to say Noches, you really got to hit the O. She said, you're walking by people at night, and you're telling them they have good butts. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, people really wanted to hear about Jesus. I think... Even when you don't intend it, it's really difficult to take Jesus to places that you don't intrinsically understand, culturally and physically and even just language barriers. So, so this is a grace he had to his disciples and a grace to you. Where do you begin? When we share Jesus, you begin where God has you right now. We start here with our neighbors, and then that border extends, and some are called to send and share Jesus in other parts of the world. But where do we begin? Right here, right now, with what God has given us. And so then he continues. This is in verse 7 and 8. As you go... Preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, so freely give. And, and what we have here is dense and rich and full and good. Essentially what Jesus is saying is this is the message that is good. This is the message that is true. As you go preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal and show people that restoration is possible. This is what Jesus had been doing. 
And look, just as an aside, I, I don't think what he's calling us all to do, like true evangelism, means that we're going to raise everybody from the dead. I think when you look at the scriptures, there's moments in the historical timeline when the miraculous was poured out in, in varying degrees. And I think around the first century world and the first century church, you see a, 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 an increase in the miraculous to show the validity of the message of Jesus. You saw it also around Moses as well and Elijah and Elisha. And so I think what he's saying, what Jesus is saying, is you're going to talk about the fact that I'm here and you're going to show people that it extends far beyond just what they believe, but it affects their life. I think when we think about the gospel in the States, in our culture, we, we, we've thinned it out, we've squashed it down, we've made it shallow in two ways. One, I think that we have, and from a really good place, taught that the gospel is a decision about a life to come, not a way of life that we live now. And so we do things like, say, four spiritual laws, and if you were to die tonight and raise a hand and go to heaven, all those are really good, by the way. But, but in that, what we've missed is that Jesus wants everything to do with your life right now, just not when. That the gospel of God impacts us not just right here and now and one day, but all the days. And then two, I think we get into this moral therapeutic deism kind of talk, which is just a way to say that God is there for us to make our lives better. M meaning, meaning that God is our ethical kind of boundary, and that's why he's good. And, and, and that's good too, but there's also an eternality and a spirituality to what we're doing. I think what Jesus is saying in this moment is remember that the full gospel affects not just your decision on where you'll be for all the days, but today too. I think it's a reminder that the full gospel isn't just a way to behave and it's not just a way to believe, but it's a way that we live our lives each and every day. The gospel is more than just a decision about belief. It is an invitation from a way to live. That you might believe in Jesus and be free. You might believe in Jesus and find healing. We see some of that now and we see some of that as a promise yet to come. The gospel is more than a decision about your eternal destiny. It, it, it's a rhythm of life from the ruler of life. That's why Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is here. We talked about it a couple weeks ago that what God does is reorder your loves around the right order that can withstand your worship. My favorite example, I've used it quite a few times, but I'll keep using it because it's good, of evangelism is uh, a guy I knew who started a church in Denver, small church. And his whole goal in the first year was just to meet people and make friends. And he defined friends, I love how he defined friends, he defined friends as someone is my friend when they ask me to hang out with their friends. It's a good definition, you know? And so he said he just wanted to meet people that didn't know Jesus. And he didn't get on a street corner with a sign and billboard and say, hey, this is what the Lord says, that's okay, I guess, that's not my style. He said he just lived life and everything pointed back to the fact that God is good. So one day this guy was having problems in his marriage and he looked at Hugh and he said, hey, it looks like you have a really good marriage. And he said, I do. And he said, can you tell me how you've done that? And he said, if I'm going to tell you that, i got to tell you about Jesus. Because the gospel impacts not just the one day, but the every day. Jesus is saying, when you go out to these people, remember that my message of kingdom impacts how they live their life all the days and today. The full gospel is not just the atonement of Christ, but it's the ability of Christ through the atonement to restore all creation. It's the whole narrative of God from Genesis to Revelation. It's not just one moment in the scriptures. It's all of the scriptures saying that God's doing something with the broken world and he wants you to find freedom, restoration, and healing, and we won't have it all today, but we will one day when he comes back because Jesus wins. So he looks at his disciples, and he says, as you go to the people you know, remember the gospel is about more than just belief. It's about more than just action. It's these two things affecting our each and every day. Then he continues, and he says in verses 9 and 10, don't take gold, silver, or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, not an extra tunic, no sandals or staff. The worker deserves his provisions. In the first century world, when you went out, there's a couple different religious groups that proselytized and that used to go out on long trips and they would take a bunch of stuff with them and they would take these beggar's pouches, which was meant there by belts, and they would ask people to give them money and they'd jump from house to house to house. Jesus is saying, don't do that. You're not gonna take any provision for you and then he says also, you're not even going to take a staff. And what was meant there by the writer, what was meant by Jesus, was to show us that God was going to provide all they needed for provision and a staff for protection. What, why he puts this in here, it's explicitly saying that you will depend on God in this endeavor. 
Now, he doesn't mean this necessarily for us today, so he's not saying if you want to go share your faith with your neighbor, take nothing with you. I can't go to Chick-fil-A without taking six princess dresses anymore. You know, I mean, we, we pack things in this world, and that's okay. What he's saying is getting at the underlying truth that it, this endeavor of evangelism is one that requires, that requires dependence on God. What it gets back to, what he's saying is that when you go and talk about me, remember that I'm the one that saves, you're not. That the people hearing and seeing the goodness of God is dependent upon God's ability, not our ability. We show up and we're used by God. I heard somebody this week talk about it like we're like the mailmen. We can't make people open the letters, but we can deliver them, you know? It's the idea that we need to recognize, especially in a culture that so much fights for control, we need to recognize and realize that ultimately God is still in control. It's why we talk often about the practice of Sabbath, because the practice of Sabbath reminds us that we're not in control of the world. And if we take a day off, God's still good, and the world doesn't explode. So, so often when we talk about sharing our faith, we need to be reminded that we're dependent on God. And there's a freedom there. <laughs> there's a freedom if you feel like you had a bad day. There's a freedom if you feel like you didn't say it the way you wanted to say it. There's a freedom there. That God says, depend on me because this is my work, not yours. Uh, like what Isaac Adams says about it, he says, our job is to proclaim salvation, not produce it. We're called to deliver messages to people. God is the one who delivers people from sin. We are used by God in his endeavor of reconciling the world. And, and then two, I think why this bit is in there about dependence. I think dependence on God fights distraction from God with other things. Just did a whole series on feasting and fasting and the nature of how much we have. And so often, so often, the amount of things in our world detract from what's truly valuable in our world. What T.S. Eliot says about it, he says, we're distracted from distraction by distraction as people. And what we have, and we have so many goods in our lives and in our world, is we lose sight of what's best. It's really easy to get sidetracked. I have not had a kitchen since October because we decided that remodeling was going to make our family stronger. And I got my range put in yesterday, guys. I haven't cooked anything yet, but it's there and it's beautiful. So for the first time in four and a half-ish months, I have lights in my kitchen, I have running water in my kitchen, I have a sink in my kitchen, and I have some way to heat things in my kitchen. It's beautiful. Let me tell you something. I have a nice range. I have great countertops. I, I like cooking gadgets and all the ways you can heat food up, right? But let me tell you what not having a kitchen for four months does. You realize really quickly what you can get by with. You realize really quickly what's really important, you know? When you take away all of the things, it reminds us what is the thing in the first place. I think as a church, in a world of a lot of goods and a lot of distractions, this text about being dependent not only reminds us that it's God's work, not ours, but it reminds us of what's truly valuable and important. It reminds us to stay focused on the things that actually matter. It's this church, it's all churches. We have, I was on a call this week with some other pastors and one drove by our property and said, how, many, how much land do you have? And I said, you know, 40-ish, eight acres. And they said, oh my goodness. I said, that's right. Um, they said, so much. And we've been given and blessed with so much. And we have a room to meet in and we have cameras and we have lights and I have a microphone. But here's what I know and you know, I don't need this microphone, <laughs> you know? Here's what I know and you know, we don't need this room. It's nice. Here's what I know and you know. I love the cameras, but they're not essential to us talking about Jesus. What we need, what we really need is we need the people of God, the presence of God, and the word of God to know more about God. That's what we need to remember. One author said it like this, a church whose members are preoccupied with material concerns still finds it hard to convince the world that it should take God seriously. So what I think Jesus is doing is saying, hey, when you go out, when you go out, remember what's truly good and truly important. As we talk and teach about Jesus, we need to remember that we're dependent on God in all of it, from our ability to our need to focus on what's truly good. Then he continues, whenever you enter a town or a village, find who's worthy there and stay with them until you leave. In the first century world, you had other people that would come and bounce from house to house to house because they got more money as they bounce from house to house to house. Jesus tells his people to take a different approach. If you're going to go to a city and you're going to stay there, you're going to stay with those people. 
And I think what it does fundamentally is show us and them as we talk about our faith that present absolutely plays a part in how we talk to people about Jesus. I think one of my favorite things to talk about is the presence of Jesus in the incarnation and how monumental that was into shaping our missiology, how we live out Jesus every day. I think there is no greater informant into how we're supposed to live out the, um, as the people of God than the presence of Jesus drawing near. What I think that means is you, you cannot do evangelism without somebody that you know. It's really difficult to show people that God is good if you don't show people that they're loved first. Oftentimes I say that you have to earn the right to speak into somebody's life. Presence plays a huge part of evangelism. Look, and there's your Billy Grahams out there, and there's your, I mean, all your, your big-name speakers. We're not talking about that. We're talking about simply that God brings people in your life. If you want to show them what Jesus is like, walk with them. We're 32 years into the mix, give or take. Jesus spent a lot of time just with his people first before he started speaking, listening and learning and loving on them. So Jesus says, when you go to a city or town, stay with them the entire time so that they might know that you're in it for them, not just for you. It's an essential part of how we show people that Jesus is good. And then 13 and 14. And if a house is worthy, let your presence come, your peace come on it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not be welcomed, uh, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your message, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or town. So in the first century world, two things happened there. One, blessings were a big deal. Blessings, the idea of giving a blessing or taking a blessing back was seen as a big deal. There's blessings throughout the Old Testament. We did a whole study on one in Numbers last summer. Blessings were a way that you could visibly and physically and spiritually impart peace onto those around you. And those blessings were thought to have power behind them. And so Jesus is saying, go and give peace to people. But if they kick you out of their house and don't believe, take that peace away from people because my peace won't go with them anymore. And so what he says when he says shake the dust off is, is a Jewish practice in that day. You would walk through other places, and if you had to walk through Samaria to get anywhere, when you got to the city gate, when you got to the boundary of Israel, you would take off your clothes, your, 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 your tunic and your shoes, and you would literally shake the Gentile dust off of you before you walked back into the country of Israel. And Texans said, that's right, <laughs> you know? And so what he's saying when he says that He's saying, essentially, if my people from Galilee reject my message of goodness, treat them like Gentiles. Because what the gospel does is it reorients our kinship, our family. We're going to get into that this series. The gospel does is it reorients not just our loves, but our affinity around those people who also love the same thing. And so what he's saying is, if those in the house of Israel reject me as the savior of Israel, then treat them like you would treat somebody not from Israel. And here's a spoiler alert. You know how Jesus treated Gentiles? He loved them, <laughs> you know? So, so he's not saying treat them harshly. He's simply saying treat them like they are from Samaria or from Assyria or from another country altogether. And what it comes down to is this idea that we probably all know, but this is the last principle, not everyone will believe. We're going to spend most of the next week talking about this. It's hard. This makes it difficult. Because when we share our faith, we are sharing not just something about Jesus, but heart, part of who we are sharing what we believe strongly, sharing our hope for them and for us and for our world. And when people say no to us, it's personal. It should be. And so Jesus at the end says, some people will say no. They will. And how you deal with that is important. And then he gets into this text. He ends it in verse uh, 15. I'll tell you the truth. It'll be more bearable for the region of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. And I found it really interesting that this is how Jesus lands it, you know? Because you can look at this and take it one of two ways. You can look at this and say, see, Jesus is defining and proclaiming wrath on those people who don't believe woe is them. And I think, sure, maybe, kind of, but, but I think if you're a first century Jewish man, you're called to go tell the good news of Jesus to your Jewish friends and family, and they don't believe, and then Jesus says, Sodom and Gomorrah is going to rain down on them. You're not like, go team God at this point. You're, you're hurting for those people that you love and maybe lose. Sodom and Gomorrah, if you don't know, in Genesis 19, it was the antithesis, I mean, it was the, the definition of evil throughout the Old Testament, and some knew. It was the definition of immorality and what was wrong. It was the definition of what happens when man is left to man's own devices and leaves God out of it. 
It's the definition of what happens when people keep rejecting the goodness of God. If you know the story. God says, I, I've heard, I've seen the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah to Abraham. And he says, I've got to go, I've got to go fix this. I've got to go let them feel the weight of their own decisions. And Abraham says, please don't do that. These are my people. My nephew's there. Please don't do that. What if there's 50 righteous people? And God says, okay, I'll save it. And then Abraham's like, well, 45, 50 is a lot of people. And God says, okay, I'll save it. And he works God all the way down to 10, you know? He says, hey, I'll save it, but there's not. And if you know the story, what happens is even as God's messengers went there to show people and redeem the city, they rejected them and they tried to do pretty awful things to them. And what that picture is in the Old Testament, it's a picture of humanity that, that chooses to live without God. One of the things we have to recognize and realize when we share our faith is, is a gift of God to the people of God is human agency. God has given you the ability to choose him or not choose him. That's what love looks like. Love can't be forced or it's not real love. God has said to all people, I want you to choose me. You can choose me, but you have the right not to choose me too. And that's hard. That's really difficult. That's what happened with Adam. Read Romans 1. This is the problem of pain in our world. Why does it exist? Because people choose to worship something other than God, which breaks our world completely because they can't stand the weight of our worship. This is where pain comes from, how Christians describe it. But God gives us human agency because he gives us love and he wants love in return. And, and so essentially what, what this case is making, I think the case the Bible makes is people that in the end don't choose God don't get God for eternity because God's a loving creature, being, deity. I love what C.S. Lewis said about it. He said, in the end, there are only two kinds of people, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. He goes on to say, hell is God's monument to human dignity and choice. So I think if you're a first century Jew and you read this section on Sodom and Gomorrah, your heart breaks for your people that might find themselves without God forever. And this is what gets back to the very beginning of our conversation on how do we do awkward things, hard things, difficult things? How do we share faith? Well, ultimately, we remember what these guys remembered as their motivator to go out, that, that sharing faith in Jesus is showing love to those around us. That's what it is at the end of the day. So we have five, six, seven practical or principles about how we share faith, and they're good, and they might help us, but at the very end of the day, what you have to realize, what Jesus is saying, is if you don't share my message of goodness, this is where they're going to end. And so they say, go out and be. Their last motivating charge before they left was, if you don't, this is what's going to happen to them. And I think they love their people. I think they realize that sharing Jesus is showing love to those around them. I think that needs to be our motivating factor as well. The often used example of an atheist named Penn Jillette, Penn and Teller, you know? It was a couple of years ago, and again, militant atheist. But he did this YouTube clip that went viral because he said, if you really believe that Jesus is good, you believe that life is found in Jesus. And furthermore, you think that if I don't have Jesus now, I don't get him forever and ever and ever and ever? How much do you have to hate me to not tell me about that God? You know? It's the beauty that what motivates our desire to communicate the goodness of Jesus to the people around us is our sheer, unadulterated love for them. And that causes us to overcome the awkward. This week, I am starting a new endeavor. I am coaching my daughter's three-year-old soccer team. <laughs> From your laughter, I gained confidence. I... <laughs> uh, I don't know how to coach soccer. I don't know how to coach without yelling. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in a different sports climate, you know? <laughs> uh, and let me tell you something. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I feel super under-equipped. I'm also a little scared. I've heard stories of soccer parents. <laughs> I'm actually terrified. I'm overwhelmed and under-resourced. Nothing about this is really something I'm that excited for. I mean, I'm glad to do it. Hoorah. But I'm not like, yes, I've been wanting to do this all of my life. I feel a little overwhelmed. I feel like, man, there's better people for this job. I feel like I'm not the one that you would pick if you could pick. I'm feeling a little afraid of these three-year-old girls, which if you have one, you understand why. Um, you know why I'm doing it? I love my kid. And the love that we have for those around us causes us to overcome the objections we have to not sharing Jesus with them. Now you're thinking right now, Charlie, you could have started this sermon with that story and been done in five minutes. I know, that's why it's at the end, <laughs> all right? But that's the beauty of it. 
is, is we have these principles on, on how we share faith and we stick to what we know and we use presence as, as a component of how we share the faith and we remind people of the whole gospel and we know that we're dependent on God and we do all these things as God uses us, but what it comes down to at the end of the day is sharing Jesus is the best way that we can love those around us, period. And there's times and places and wisdom, but, but that has to be our reason why we go because we love people around us. And so look, as we go out today, I think the question we simply ask is, we pray that the Holy Spirit might give us the opportunity to have conversations about Jesus with those who need it in our lives, those who don't know Jesus. It's a part of what we do as the people of God as we're sent. So my prayer for you, and I hope your prayer is, God, give me one. Give me one opportunity. Give me one person. Give me one place so that I might love people by showing people and sharing the message of Jesus. Because this is some moment when he sends his people for the first time. Were they scared? Yes. <laughs> Have it all together? No. Did God go with him? Absolutely. It reminds me of uh, this movement that started a couple years ago. Um, it's a teen movement by a kid named Jordan Whittemer. And he started this movement called How to Live, I think it is, or How to Life. And he was 17. He said, I got a year left of high school, and I want to make sure my friends know Jesus. And so he started talking about Jesus, and he said, I'm going to have an event. 700 kids showed up. And then he said, next year I'm going to have some more events, and 2,000 kids showed up. And this kid just started events where he started talking about Jesus to the people around him. And now, three or four years later, they have over 100 events in 22 states in six different countries all over the world, simply because he wanted to share love with people by showing them Jesus. All for Gen Z, you know, so I can't be a part of that group. <laughs> It reminds me of the purpose and point of the church in the first place. Like this gathering, this gathering existed so that we might find rest from going out. This gathering existed so that we might take the message of Jesus out into the world and come back and tell people how it went. This gathering exists so that we might be poured into, so that we might press out into the world and show people that God is good. This gathering is where we refuel because we have a job to do. And Jesus gathers his people it says, go love people by showing them that I'm good, and I'll go with you. And that's how we begin the next two chapters in Matthew. Let me pray for us. God, I'm thankful that you've called us to be a part of your mission. I'm thankful for ways that you meant the disciples in practical terms. And guys, this is going to be hard. Let me give you some tips. I hope that we remember one or two as we go out from our time together as well. Holy Spirit, just... Give us a heart for sharing the gospel with those around us, for showing people the kingdom of Jesus, not just decisions, but dependence on you in every single day of our life. It might change how we're living because you've called us to something better. You're inviting us into a better way. Holy Spirit, give us opportunities to grow the kingdom as we walk and talk because we're a sent people. Give us courage. Give us opportunity. And give us an ability to speak truth into places that need it the most so that people might see the goodness of God. I pray these things in the name of Jesus.